Communication Specialist here for the Mount Washington Observatory. You guys being right in our backyard here, I'm sure you've you've uh, looked up at the mountaintop quite a bit and seen some towers, some things going on up top here. Hopefully some of you have made it to the top of Mount Washington before. Uh, but I, before I even get into what it is we do up here, I just want to skip right to the good stuff, which is... I want to show you what the temperature is right now, because it's actually pretty cold, even even for my standards up here. So I don't know, this may be hard for you guys to read. Can you actually read that? Sounds like you can. Yeah. We're at, we're at minus 20.0 degrees at the moment. Uh, and then on top of that, we're going to take a look at another chart here. This is our haze wind speed chart, which is actually it's an analog instrument that we've been using for many decades up here. So this shows 24 hours worth of wind speed, as you can kind of see. On here, this actually reflects back at midnight, uh, and if you could read the graph on here, this would show about 55 miles per hour for a wind speed right now. Up around here, where you can see the higher peaks that were going toward the outside of the chart, uh, that was about 80 miles an hour today. So far, our gust uh, for the day, I think, is up to about the low 80 mile per hour range. So if you take uh, minus 20, and then you combine that with a 55 mile an hour wind, that makes a current wind chill factor of minus 61 degrees, uh, which is pretty cold. I'm sure you guys are used to some cold there as well. Uh, but basically what that translates to is if you're outside and you weren't going to wear a glove, uh, you're going to get frostbite in less than five minutes. So uh, even for us out here, we are completely covered up head to toe. In fact, I'm still even wearing my hat inside because it's still a little chilly today. Um, but that's temperature. That's wind speed. I want to show you some other stuff. Uh, actually, you know, I'll show you some more stuff in just a second, but uh, pretty much generally speaking, I don't know if you guys actually kind of grasp what it is the main focus of the observatory up here is anyways. Maybe you've heard us uh, on the radio, maybe you've gone to our website before for forecasts, but essentially what we're doing up here is we're a nonprofit mountaintop weather station. Uh, we've been here since 1932, so now we have 81 years in a row of weather observations. And basically, the main goal here is 24 hours a day. There's always someone going outside every single hour of the day. In fact, just to my right here is actually the stairs leading up to our tower uh, and outside, which is where Ted got, Ted got to uh, go outside and kind of play a little bit in the elements. And basically uh, what we do is we take hourly weather observations. We measure a lot of things like the winds, like the temperature, uh, some other instruments I'll show you here. Uh, and we report that both uh, for internal uses, uh, for research and things like that, uh, but then also we report it to the National Weather Service, so that way when you guys are going to say weather.gov or AccuWeather or weather.com or, or however you get your weather, uh, you're going to find current conditions up here, and it's coming from someone just like myself. Uh, and this is kind of a dying breed of, of uh, weather observing. Most weather stations are automated. There aren't going to be a, an actual human being who's a weather observer, uh, but that's what makes this kind of unique up here. Uh, and basically this place couldn't exist unless there were people up here most of the time. Uh, and there is a really good reason for that. I'm actually going to swap over the computer for a second because I want to show you a couple images of what it looks like up here besides just inside. So hold on a second. We're going to freeze and look kind of funny on the camera as I <laughs> step off the screen. Yeah, there we go. See, there's yeah, Ted making a really good face. That was awesome. Uh, so this is a, a view, especially if any of you guys have been up here before. You've probably seen this. Uh, this is kind of the outer edge of the Sherman Adams State Park building up here, which we're housed in. And there is our observation tower. Uh, in fact, where Ted got to go to the very top of today. Yeah, I'll show you a video at the end where we cl all, we climbed up onto that tower where that person is, except the conditions were definitely not like that. Cloudy and super windy and really extreme. It was awesome. Yeah, so, and right now we're still in the clouds, maybe breaking out, but say if it was a clear view, this is what it would actually look like from our office window here looking north, actually uh, not too far from you guys. In fact, probably just a little bit to the west, uh, Bethlehem would probably be in the picture there. Uh, so that's what it looks like when it's actually clear. Sometimes we can get great visibilities of about 130 miles or more. Uh, but oftentimes, this is what it looks like. In fact, about 60% of the time, we're stuck in the middle of a cloud, uh, which is fine. But the thing is, when we're also below freezing, we start accumulating this stuff, uh, which is called rime ice. So if you guys ever looked up into the mountains, say after a big storm has passed, nice sunny day, maybe you've seen a big white line in the trees, uh, there's all of this stuff that's actually covering uh, all the trees. And basically, um, what you're seeing here is frozen fog. It's just kind of liquid that's coming out of the clouds. And so because of that, uh, all of our stuff gets covered up in it. In fact, this is actually a chimney on the building next to us, though you probably couldn't figure out what that actually was with all that rime ice on there. Uh, so because of that, we actually had to come up with a lot of creative ways to get rid of all this ice uh, and 
as as Ted got to see firsthand earlier, climbing all the way to the top of this tower. Uh, most of our wind instruments are up there, so we had to come up with some pretty unique stuff, uh, including um, if anyone's ever seen this instrument before, which maybe you haven't, uh, this is a custom instrument that we use to measure our wind. Basically, we took aircraft technology and, and, and uh, took how airplanes measure their own airspeed with a pitot tube, uh, and that's how we measure the wind up here. And it's all heated and everything, and that, that's wonderful. Uh, but to show you what this stuff actually looks like in action, in clouds, in Rhymeis formation, pretty much everything's covered up there that you can see, except for maybe the pitot tube portion on the upper left side of the, the shot there. Uh, so obviously it's important uh, for us to be up here because if we weren't, imagine trying to, to run this place remotely or have just a bunch of... Uh, say computers running this whole place uh, that probably wouldn't be possible especially we'd miss a lot of good data uh, and some really big storms up here and, th and that's the last thing we want um, but anyways just besides the wind and things like that I'll kinda zoom around here and show you some interesting stuff that's behind me uh, I showed you the haze chart that was behind me that looks like a pretty windy day well I'll show you actually our second windiest day uh, the windiest day we've ever recorded on the haze chart before uh, this was back just in 1980, so not too long ago. Uh, we recorded a wind gust of 182 miles per hour, and in fact, you can't actually see where it is because it actually went off the charts somewhere in this area up there. Uh, and in fact, had to turn on another instrument, uh, which is above that haze chart. Uh, basically, it's a larger version. It's just called a Barton chart, and theoretically, it can measure wind speeds up to 285 miles per hour if, say, we were to get that high. Um, some other things we measure, as you might imagine, uh, especially if you're into weather, would be barometric pressure. What you're looking at here is our digital barometer that we use often. Basically, we're looking at trends in the atmospheric pressure. It tells us a lot about what's going to be going on, uh, probably right now, but also in the future. Higher pressure is great. Uh, nice sunny weather. Lower pressure, not so great. Uh, and to just kind of sneak in front of the camera for a second, uh, this is showing millibars. You may be a little more familiar with, say, Inches of mercury, you might hear uh, a meteorologist say, right now the pressure is 29.50 inches, and then they'll say if it's rising, steady, falling, anything like that. Uh, but what's really interesting to note between these two numbers is if you just look at that 23.37 number, that's actually our pressure up here on top of Mount Washington at 6,000 feet. Down below it, though, you see it's a bigger number, 29.51. Uh, that's actually if you were to take our pressure up here and bring it down to sea level. And so you notice that this number is much larger. Well, that's because as you go up in elevation, you actually drop in pressure. So the difference between these two numbers here is about 20%. Uh, so we actually uh, we have to breathe a little bit harder up here. Our bodies have to work a little bit harder, unless, of course, you're used to living at this elevation, which uh, after time you kind of get used to. So I don't know if... Uh, I don't know if Ted's necessarily acc acclimated to this weather just yet, but I'm sure if he spent a couple weeks up here, he'd be he'd be ready to go and probably ready ready to run a marathon. Um, but anyways, that's that's just really a really small chunk of some of the things that go on up here. Uh, we do a lot of forecasting. If you've ever been to our site uh, and wanted to know what the weather's going to be like in say uh, the White Mountains, especially above 4,000 feet or so. Uh, obviously, our, our site's a really great resource for, for checking out conditions, uh, which can be drastically different from the valley, as we're kind of seeing right now. Um, and then also, we do a lot of research up here. And so, uh, those are the big things. We take observations, uh, we're forecasting all the time, and we do a lot of research. And then on top of that, also education, kind of like what we're doing here. Uh, we get a chance, especially myself, uh, to speak with a lot of different students throughout the country, uh, kind of all over North America. Hi, Leah. <laughs> Hi Miss Leah. <laughs> Excellent. And so as you see, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. In fact, even just off screen, we have a lot of visitors staying overnight, uh, which is really exciting, including all of our staff up here. Uh, so there's a lot going on, but actually, I wanna I wanna give Ted a moment to kind of explain some of his experiences so far, his short short yeah, time up here. We have a question first. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Is it a lot of fun? Is it a lot of fun? Yeah. Oh, it's been so much fun. You're going to see how fun it is. You're going to see how fun it is in a couple of videos in a little bit. Uh, but imagine getting puffed up like a big marshmallow wearing, I think I probably had on seven or eight layers of clothing. At one point, my huge puffy jacket got blown off and totally unzipped by the wind. Uh, you Hopefully you'll see that on the video too. 
Uh, we went out there. There's actually been 10 or 11 people that came up here with us. Uh, folks from um, Eastern Mountain Sports, folks uh, representing Vast Footwear, um, other companies, and some folks from, uh, who else came up here? So the, from the Mount Washington Observatory, oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, then, and, and, Eddie. and then this Eddie. guy, Eddie. <laughs> this is my man, Eddie. He came up to visit, and my dad came up here. So here's my dad. Everyone come in here and meet my dad. My dad, Jim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're having a, we're having a people here. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks everyone for showing up. I know I had to dress up like crazy during morning meeting and get everyone psyched about it. Um, I hope famous. I hope family style dinner was great. Um, but. I and I can narrate while the movie. Yeah, you want right? me to show you that? So I think what we're do, gonna do, um, if that's all right with you all, is move into some videos, and I'll try and narrate uh, over the sound of some of the wind, which is pretty extreme. Uh, so you can hear the difference when the GoPro camera. Uh, see if you can figure out uh, which one's me. Okay, I challenge you to do that. <laughs> challenge accepted. Yeah. No, I'm gonna try real. Yeah, there we go. So here we are, we walked out on the observatory deck, and as soon as you get out in front of the tower, where we have winds coming uh, totally unblocked from the west, from uh, hundreds of miles, I'd assume, right? And thousands, coming, actually. Thousands of miles. Yeah. And, and now this is the wind coming from the west, and we can literally lean into it, uh, and hopefully you can see, oh yeah, there's me. <laughs> uh, I, I brought up a banana suit, thank you, Mosses. Uh, I told you I might have a, a costume or two, but they, so obviously the wind's wicked, wicked, loud, uh, super loud, and really strong up there. Look in the background. That's not my camera angle. That's that's my dad in the yellow. He's trying to lean into the wind. We're all totally masked out. We have goggles, literally zero skin uh, that is exposed uh, because we get frosted or frost uh, frostbite super fast. Uh, and so in a little bit here, you'll stop seeing all the selfie video sh shots of me. Um, but we'll skip a little bit further ahead and watch <laughs> all of us try and like, like Frankenstein monsters uh, across the <laughs> Banana costume shows the wind. It's actually a scientific costume. <laughs> how, many, how many banana suits got moved? Uh, how many miles? Eight, like, How miles? <laughs> Pretty crazy. Yeah, that's true. I, I think I am. I officially am the first banana on the top of uh, Mount Washington. Especially, definitely the first winter ascent. High five, sure, take it all the way. <laughs> Trying to read the GoPro camera because everything gets covered dry mics. Yeah, look at that. So there's Ben trying to just walk forward. <laughs> this, is pretty, this is pretty funny I'm, to fast forward. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So I'm just leaning back into the wind. and I, Here you go. Look at this. Woo, banana. <laughs> so I was trying to get a little bit more, uh, like, hold the banana out, get some, catch some more wind, like I'm uh, sailing my ship across the... <laughs> <laughs> Super fun, and then you can see the tower right there on the left the background. I so, we've been up there in the summertime, and right by that box, I don't know if Rob's out there, but right by that box is the X for the geocache on video. The geocache Rob was telling me about. So, that's the, the webcam that, that shows from the observatory deck. Cool, we're going to show one more video. Um, this is us climbing up the tower and getting on top. We're in that really nice photo uh, with the uh, you know blue skies that guy was pointing to the west. This is what it looked like for us today. Climbing up the dark tower cave. <laughs> we'll come out a hole here in a second. There was rime ice on the camera lens, so it was a little foggy. But you can definitely see what's going on. Yeah, so basically what Ted's doing right now is what we need to do every single hour when we de-ice. We, we go up approximately 
three flights of spiral staircases, uh, up steel ladders, all the way to the very top. Uh, pretty much the highest you can climb on top of Mount Washington and easily the most exposed part. So uh, right here, you're looking at the very top where that picture of all the instruments were. Uh, and you'll see in just a bit, Ted's actually going to climb up there and, and keep a really close eye on what happens to his jacket when he attempts to get up right here. Because uh, it's kind of like the hand of God actually opening up the jacket and he almost loses it right off the bat. I had to call Patagonia about that. A little product testing back. Okay, I'm coming up. Here we go. Alright, Crawley. Oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Jacket totally blown off, unzipped. I'm gonna grab the camera here in a second and give kind of give the view of what we had. So there's my jacket totally unzipped. I, I had to hold on to the now yeah, we'll do a replay. A yeah. replay? Oh yeah. yeah. This is the this is the right before it opened. Yeah. So that was our view. We saw we could see about a couple couple hundred feet. This might just take a second. The mouse is showing up very small on my screen. Uh oh, it dropped out. Okay, go. Well, hold on, Faith. I see. No, they just dropped out of the group. We got most of the program. We'll see if they call us back. Yeah, they should be able to call back in. And they're supposed to be Thanks. recording this whole thing too. Yeah, so this is just this is just the bridge right there, uh, recording a lot of the stuff. No, they they dropped out for some reason, but they had the number to call back in, so hopefully they'll do that pretty quickly. Yeah, 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 totally. Okay, there we go. go. Okay. Okay. Excellent. You're just in time. We just froze it right before <laughs> Ted almost loses his jacket. Are you guys ready? All right, here it comes. So watch carefully. It's unzipping right there. <laughs> Ripped off. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't be the first person to have that happen to. In fact, a lot of people have actually had jackets destroyed on top of the tower. Uh, if you forget to zip up a pocket, uh, you can pretty much kiss that pocket goodbye. It'll almost rip off your jacket in some really uh, very, very strong winds up there. Well, so that's the end of that one. Um, I'm gonna. I, I took a, a bunch of footage, and I still got to go through it. But um, found those two videos free for all to check out for uh, for tonight. I'm gonna bring some other photos and some videos back to you all. Uh, uh, I don't know whenever I get a chance to edit it, but well, maybe I'll do a morning meeting announcement for you all. Hey, there we are again. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I was I wanted to do was just offer some time, some space, if anyone had any questions, um, uh, any like legit weather questions or silly questions or um, anything about my experience. So feel free, if you got something, come on in front of the camera. If somebody has a question, come over and stand right here and ask Ted a question. Come on here. Yeah, Josh. Hey, Ted. Josh, how's it going, Josh? Uh, pretty good. So I have some uh, questions from biology because this is like a makeup thing. We missed some homework. <laughs> so we're so getting extra those. credit for coming to the thing yeah. tonight. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's the average temperature up there in winter? In winter time. I don't know. Average in winter? Oh, I'm going to look off to the staff meteorologists here who are actually just off screen. Oh, uh oh, everyone's kind of disappeared. <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you our year-round average is actually below freezing up here, and so actually because of that, there's there's technically some permafrost. Uh, our year-round average, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I always get this number wrong, and I don't want to give you the wrong. Yeah, so basically, it round, I won't give you the to the tenths, but it's 27 degrees is our year-round average temperature. Okay. Yeah, so not for the winter, but that's, I mean, think about that. Over the whole entire year, when it's nice and and sunny and warm up here having highs in the 70 71 yeah i mean or... maybe to put things in perspective yeah. our our daily average temperature for this time of the year 
is is now we're looking, I believe, in say about the the sing in the the lower teens. So like 12 degrees is about um, our daily average temperature for this time of the year. And by the time we get into the colder months, like say January or February, we're looking at daily average temperatures that are actually uh, about single digits. Uh, so uh, imagine that's an average. So either side of that uh, can get very cold. In fact, our record low temperature here is actually all time minus 47. Uh, that's our record. Uh, I have not seen anything close to that, and now my third winter up here saw negative 35 last year. Uh, but that's it, and I suppose <laughs> that's that's good enough. That's pretty good. Yeah, and that's yeah. without a wind chill. All right, I have just well, one more have... question. Okay. Um, how do you deal with the leftover food up there? How do we that's deal with it? Uh, that's that's I don't I don't really know what you're talking about. What do you mean? Oh. <laughs> There, 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 there is no left. That's not. Food. That's not. That's yeah. not an issue up here. <laughs> so right. jo Josh, Josh spends the fall working in the farm and forest program, and they uh, do a lot of composting. Our school does composting with all of our foods after meals and stuff. And so I'm, I'm assuming maybe that's where the root of it came from. Josh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well. As you can imagine, uh, especially since we live, we well, I never really explained the fact that the observers up here, we're up here for eight days at a time. We live here as well when we're up here for those eight time, uh, eight days. And in fact, just below uh, the floor below me is actually where the living room, the dining room, our bunk rooms are. Uh, and we have a full stock kitchen. We have a lot of um, non-perishable food that we buy in bulk. And then pretty much what we do is each week we kind of take turns uh, before coming up for the shift. And we'll go to, say, like Hannaford's or something, and we'll buy all the fresh food for that week. So generally speaking, we're pretty good at it uh, by now. There isn't too much left over. And anything left over, we just save for the other shift, and, and hopefully they eat it. But uh, sadly, as you can imagine, logistics up here, especially composting, which is pretty much impossible to do. Uh, they try down at Lakes of the Clouds Hut for for most of the summer anyways, but uh, that's a pretty short season down there. So uh, unfortunately, not really an option for us. Hey, cool. I have another question. Thanks, thanks Josh. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Ted. Hey, Aaron. How's it going? Good. Um, so <laughs> I've heard that, like, Mount Washington is home to, like, some of the most severe weather, and I was wondering what makes it be able to be the most severe, like, around here. Sure, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, basically, so there are a few different variables that go into that. Um, so Ted had kind of mentioned, like, when they're on the deck up there, they're standing on the deck and basically looking out across the horizon. Uh, there is not another mountain that's taller than us out to the west until you get to about South Dakota or so. So there's more than a thousand miles you can travel, or at least the wind can travel, where it's going to travel completely uninterrupted. So already we're going to have much higher winds than the valley. So that's going to give us really high winds here. Uh, our elevation is really interesting because we're obviously we're not the by by any means the tallest mountain in the world. Mount Everest much taller, more than 29,000 feet. Um, but what's really interesting is here at about 6,000 feet, uh, there's the top of 6,000, and then there's kind of an imaginary ceiling that's above that uh, called it's the tropopause. It's the upper level of our atmosphere that we're in, the troposphere, and that's that could be anywhere say just. Um, it could be somewhere, say, like around 30,000 feet. So there's actually this really small little area now that wind has to travel through between 6,000 feet and, say, 30. And it's kind of the same idea as if you put your thumb over a garden hose. The water is going to accelerate out. Well, uh, air pretty much acts the same way. So right away we're going to have some really strong and really accelerated wind speeds up here. Pretty much there's nothing else to block it. Um, so that's that's already going to give us some severe winds. Uh, on top of that, kind of where we are geographically, I mean, think about New England and New England weather. It's changing all the time. Uh, that's because any time of the year we can have really warm influences from, say, the tropics. Like, we're going to get all this moisture from a big nor'easter this weekend. All that's going to come up from the Gulf of Mexico. But it's also going to meet really, really cold air. In fact, a lot of it that's already here right now. Uh, and when these things combined, basically it's like the perfect fuel for a huge storm. And, and where we are throughout the country right now, I mean, basically if you look at a map of all – the, uh, in fact, actually, I think I have an image of this, but excuse me a second. Uh, if you look at a map of major storm tracks across the country, uh, where we are in New Hampshire, and in particular in New England, we have just a ton of storms that come through. We're in a really active path for a lot of different, um, a lot of different storm tracks. And I want to see if I can actually find you that image because uh, it tells the story much better than I can probably explain. Um, Oh, that's a shame. I can't find it off the top of my head. Um, but anyways, 
Uh, it's that typical New England weather. We get a ton of weather up here. We got that high wind, the high winds. And then on top of that, at 6,000 feet, uh, it's already going to be a lot colder up here too. So every thousand feet, you're going to lose about between two and five degrees up here. I mean, you can already see how much colder it is uh, down by you guys. But who knows? Maybe they'll actually even out. I know tonight down the valley. I think you guys can see, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about minus 10. That's tonight, right? Yeah, so it's going to get pretty downright chilly there. In fact, really uh, not much warmer than it is up here. So uh, a lot of different variables, and that's kind of the uh, the really general answer. And I know even that was pretty long. <laughs> but thanks for asking the question. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Yep. Oh, here comes Carl with a question. All right, Carl. Hey. Hey, Carl. Hey, I was just wondering, with all this talk of the high weather, does the wind, does the wind ever die down? Is there ever a calm day on the uh, on the top of Mount Washington? And I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, um, those those days are a little less common up here, as you might imagine. Our year on average is about 35 miles per hour, uh, which is actually pretty high, considering it's actually it makes us the the windiest reporting weather station in, in all of America here. Um, but there are actually several days, mostly in the summer, where our wind speeds are, on average, much lower. Where, believe it or not, there have been a few hours, even in the past uh, three years here, where we've reported completely calm winds. Uh, but those days are, are really quite rare. But yeah, it happens. Well, thanks, Carl. We got one more. Anybody else have one more question? Hi. Hey, Coltrane. How's it going? Good. I was wondering what kind of tools you use to get the ice that that goes on everything off. Is there is there one upstairs that someone can grab real quick? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we could show you. Actually, it's gonna someone's actually gonna grab one right now because I, it's a, uh, it's a really technical uh, piece of equipment up here. It's it's pretty expensive, um, and you have to know that I'm kidding right now because what I'm gonna show you in about a minute. Uh, when one of my coworkers grabs it from upstairs, uh, basically we use a big metal crowbar to hit all of the metal surfaces around all of our instruments. Uh, because imagine if you're like Ted was today, and you're struggling to keep your goggles on, your hat, you can barely see, and you're also trying to swing something to carefully scrape off ice in 100 mile an hour winds. Uh, it's not easy, so we kind of just figured out that using a big metal crowbar and swinging at the metal that's not directly on our instruments <laughs> works really nicely. Uh, and pretty much we haven't found a, a better way to de-ice things so far. And actually, oh, here it is. Here it is. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. Here it is. Here's the tool. <laughs> really, yeah, very scientific, very yeah. technical, very expensive, uh, and also very cold right now, so I'm not going to keep holding this because it's, <laughs> it's a little bit frozen. frozen. We can ask Bill uh, in the maintenance crew if they have any special de-icing tools back at Canvas. Well, cool. Is there any any last questions? Okay, one more question from the center. I have one more question. What do you do to keep the camera from blowing away from the videos? Oh, what did you do? Yeah, what did you do today? Oh, uh, when I was filming, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I attached sort of like this crowbar... I had a ski pole, and some ski poles, uh, you can extend it and shorten it, and I just took the whole bottom half of the ski pole off that has the basket and the spike part, and I held on to the handle, and I took the, a GoPro camera, which has a bunch of different mounts, and basically I just bolted it to the end of the camera, or end of the ski pole, so when I was behind myself, I could hold it and have it looking like this. Uh, usually like that, except I don't have the banana suit on, obviously. So you probably don't know who was in that shot. But so here I am. So this is it. Just having a little bit of a um, a pull that could get the camera away from me, and I could show other people or film other people as well. It is really cold. Yeah, that is really cold. That's <laughs> Hi, Becky. I, I, I have a question. Um, uh -oh. The weather observatory has a pretty amazing job. Can you hear me still? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. What has it got to do to get this job? Because it just seems like a pretty special job. 
Yeah, oh, wow. that's, that's, a that's a good question. We get that quite a bit because when we finally get around to explaining all the the really unique skills that kind of go into uh, the lifestyle, the science, uh, you know, all the above, uh, a lot of us kind of come from fairly similar backgrounds. Uh, myself personally, a, a little little more of a atypical route. Actually, I went to the University of New Hampshire. I studied environmental conservation and education. Um, and uh, I started working with the Appalachian Mountain Club. In fact, I was working in a lot of the backcountry huts. Uh, but I grew up with like a huge fascination for weather. Just loved thunderstorms. Was always one of those kids that was like very, very apt to be on the computer and be like, all right, how much snow? I want to know to like the tenth of an inch. What are we gonna get for a snowstorm? Uh, and things like that. And so basically, I I had a chance to do an internship up here. Uh, and did, I guess, a good enough job so that when I applied for a full-time job up here to also teach and do distance learning programs, uh, since that's a little bit more in my background, uh, I was able to fulfill the role up here. But for a lot of people, and I'll, I'll kind of speak on their behalf, uh, we have a lot of meteorologists. I mean, people who are going to school for four years, um, a lot of different schools we represent here, like Penn State, uh, SUNY Oswego, Rutgers, a lot of different schools. A lot of people are actually just meteorologists. They study... Uh, all the physics behind atmospheric science, uh, and usually kind of like me are a little bit of a weather nerd, uh, because this is like the ultimate place to really uh, not only just study and kind of observe weather, but actually really experience it like Ted did today. And that's, you know, definitely one of the special reasons. Uh, I mean, just what makes us special up here at the observatory is there are people up here all the time and, and have been since 1932. So, uh a lot of different routes for the most part. A lot of people are skilled with, say, IT, computers, or education like me, or uh, the meteorology and forecasting and all that. And so a lot of different skills got to come into play up here. Awesome. <clears throat> well, I think that's all the questions. Okay, awesome. Cool. Thanks, Ben. So, yeah, I mean, this was, this was super cool, really awesome experience. I mean, and those of you all that know, I literally just – answered a Facebook post and won this amazing trip to come up here. And so I feel super fortunate to have um, had warm feet with my awesome new Vast shoe boots that they gave me um, and get an amazing uh, trip up the auto road with the snowcat. And I'll show you some photos of that too later. Um, but to be able to have this experience that these folks offered uh, to bring my dad in from Michigan um, was really special. So if you have any other questions later on, you can feel free to – um, to let, ask me in, in, when I get back onto campus, um, and I'll answer them, hopefully with some pretty cool photos. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess just sort of... Hey, say uh, bye. Thanks, Ted. Yeah. Well, yeah. So thanks a lot. Hey, guys. Thanks, thanks for you. connecting. Yeah, thank you so much for coming in after Family Style, and I really appreciate it. So uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. I'll see you back on campus tomorrow. Hey, bye. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care.